because I'm joined here with two goats, two Portuguese goats. Uh, on one side, we have Antonio Felix Acosta that you guys know, real driver, Formula E world champion, winner on Macau two times, Le Mans winner. We can keep going. On the other side, we have Random <laughs> Cosign, as you know, close friend already, part of the podcast for the future. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Picard, do you want to start it with the first question? Okay, so yeah, that will be a pleasure, really. Um, so we should start as the way that you you went into motorsports. What inspired you to pursue a career? Well, first of all, thanks for for having me, guys. It's uh, it's always good to talk about racing, uh, especially when you're on on holidays for a few days and there's not much racing going on. So always cool to take a break from the break and and go back to some racing stuff um i was very fortunate to be honest because i grew up in a family that was involved in in motorsports both on my mom's side and on my on my father's side with my on my mother's side i had my my uncles which were were racing up today uh, up to today they are still the only three brothers to compete in le mans together in the same car on the same time uh, my three Mel O'Briner ankles. Uh, so obviously that side of the family was, was connected to motorsports and I grew up watching them race. And then, all, and then on my father's side, I was also very fortunate because um, my granddad was the president of Castro when, when I was young. And then when he died, my father and then the family took over. So also the, that side of the family was always connected to, to oil. And uh, and to motorsports, obviously indirectly, as Castrol is a brand that is always connected to to the motorsport world. And um, and I had two older brothers that were racing, so naturally I grew up watching them race. And then my oldest brother João, uh, he took me he took me on a go kart once in a in a small you know go kart track here in in Portugal, and it was love at, at first sight. And you know you know sooner than i could realize we were doing national championships world championships european championships you name it so um you know i was very fortunate to to also be able as a family to to support the initial steps financially it's a, it's a, it's a hard sport to you know to to support and to and to help the kids progress and and that's actually a, a little dream that i have for the future to try and open some doors um, but I was lucky to be able to take those steps and, and, and obviously when it got really, really, really expensive, uh, Formula 3, Formula 2, I was able to, to be supported and backed by, by Red Bull. So everything just looked like it, it happened. Um, almost everything looked like it happened at the right time, at the right place, except my, my Formula 1 seat, which it looked like it was going to be there and then, and then it wasn't. But, um, I think everything happens for a reason and, uh, today I'm a, I'm a professional, uh, you know, racing driver, and I and I can't complain. I know I'm very lucky. A lot of people would give so much to be in my position, so um, I never take this for granted, and uh, and I make sure that I have loads of fun, and and I enjoy it every day. That, that, that's great. You know, we're talking about that really s- small stint as a test driver in Formula One, and you know, it's a small world because one of the guests I have on the podcast was an engineer that work with you and uh, at the Red Bull factory that now work with Sim Racing. What's his name? Building uh, uh, Mark Foster. Is, uh, he was in yeah. part of the test driver. I think he said to me uh, when they have to prepare for the donuts on Abu Dhabi so that they <laughs> made uh, some tests with you. <laughs> so I don't know if this one is a real story, but yeah. <laughs> it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite funny. Uh, and uh, during That's that actually period, a good story, yeah. You, you, Oh, okay. So, and anything that you can add to that? Oh, oh, well, that's so basically that's a fun story because I was I was in the simulator doing some normal simulator stuff for for the team, you know, testing the next front wing or whatever. And uh, they told me to get out of the, the real simulator and said, "Tony, we have to go to the car park to try uh, to try something on the on the F one car." And that was very weird because. You know, never. Whenever we have a test or something, and in those days we were still testing quite a lot, but we were going to Rockingham or Croft or stuff like that, just to mm-hmm. put mileage on some parts that needed some mileage on rough tracks. And UK has a lot of those. And then I get to the car park, and there is an F1 car with a steering wheel fully locked, and the front left wheel is bolted 
on the tarmac. And then basically I got in the car, they fire up the car, the steering was fully turned. And then I flat out, dropped the clutch and I start to do donuts and the car is bolted to the ground. And then they took it to the, I think it's the Burj Khalifa or the, that, or the, the white big building in Dubai. I think that's yeah, how yeah, you yeah. name it. Yeah. And uh, and then you see DC actually was David Coulter doing the donuts there and it's it looks insane, but the car is actually bolted on the ground and I tested that system on, on the car park that day. <laughs> no, that, that, that's cool. That's I, I didn't realize it was uh, yeah, it have to be have to be locked in some way, but I never re realized it will be bolt to the <laughs> to the and and we know that that was one part, one sad part of uh, you have almost the seat ready to go to Formula One. And we already discussed this one in a lot of, probably a lot of TV shows, even in, Port in Portuguese language. But from that experience, what you take as a most part or what was the biggest part of that experience as a test driver for Red Bull? Well, at the, at the time, it was... It was hard to accept not going to Formula One. Um, as you said, like it, it was a given. I was doing well, especially the year before 2012. I was, I was winning everything. And obviously that year there was Red Bull was racing with Sebastian Vettel and Mark Weber, And they, there was no seats available. And Toroso was Jean-Eric Verne. And uh, who was the other driver at the time? I think it was... Who was teammates with Fern? It was Daniel Ricardo, and um, and there was no seats available. And then 2013, I did World Series racing again, and I was racing against some very good drivers like Stoffel Van Dorn, which then ended up going to Formula One. Kevin Magnussen, which is still in F1, and it was between the three of us. So I ended up finishing third that year in the championship. I got a bit unlucky. I got some punctures and ran ran out of fuel in in some races, whatever. Uh, but I won some races that year, and it was it was a good. It was a good year, um, not as dominant as the year before, but it was still a good season. Um, but everything was done, signed. I had my suit, everything ready. And then last minute, you know, they told me the seat wasn't mine anymore. And there was going to be a Grand Prix in Russia that year. And, and it, yeah, uh, they had a, a yeah. Russian driver in the pool. So at yeah. the time, I didn't yeah. understand. I was too young to understand that side of the sport. Today, I I completely understand it. And... Maybe it's not fair for me to say, but I think if I was in the place of Red Bull and, and my bosses at the time, I would have probably done the same thing. I understand the commercial side of the sport and the financial side of the sport is is also what keeps it moving. So, unfortunately, I was just on the wrong side of the of the story. Um, but at the same time, the same day they gave me the phone call saying, "Antonio, you're not going to F1 anymore." Uh, but you're going to DTM with Audi, which at the time DTM was a huge championship. It's super known and, mm -hmm. and was a great thing to, to do. But I was just crying my eyes out. I didn't give a, a shit about going to DTM mm -hmm. with Audi at that moment. And then half an hour later, they call me again and say, actually, it's not Audi, it's BMW. Uh, because Audi already has a Portuguese driver and they don't want two Portuguese drivers. Yeah, it was Philippe Albuquerque there at the time. which yeah, he, yeah. he then ended up going away, going to LMP1, whatever. But... That's the way it happened. And uh, and how I realized my biggest lesson was when I did my first DTM race weekend, um, I had so much fun. Like, I just, what I didn't realize was that the two or three years before F1, I, you know, I wasn't having fun anymore. It was, it was a real job and real pressure. And I was waking up every morning to see if the phone call was coming and everything. And, and when I went to DTM, I started having fun again. And, and I think that's when I realized like, okay, there is life behind yeah. f1 or post f1 um i can make money i can be a professional driver i can have a life out of this and uh and honestly i to this day i thank red bull with all of my heart because okay they didn't give me an f1 seat but they gave me a career so i have no no complaints on that note because you're we, we can now look backwards you can now look backwards to your career do you think by not having the seat or a second seat, either Toro Rosso or Red Bull. Do you think you dodge a bullet? No, no, no. Uh, actually, I would have liked to to go there, uh, at least to know how good I actually was, because a lot of the kids that are, or not kids anymore, but a lot of the guys that are doing well in F1 today, it's people that I've beaten in the past and, and that I've had good racing with, like okay. Carlos Sainz, uh, Kevin Magnussen, Lando Norris, 
whatever. All these guys, I've raced against all of them. Daniel Ricciardo, Valtteri Bottas. I've raced is, against yeah. all of them and I was able to compete yeah. and, and win against them. So I would have at least enjoyed to have a go. And if I wasn't good enough, then I wasn't good enough. But I think having a go would have been would have been cool. And obviously, how with how things turned out, with then Vettel going to Ferrari, that the the, the seat that Red Bull opened up super soon. And I think the problem for Kvyat there was that it was too young; it was too quick for him. But I was I'm obviously two or three years older. Maybe I could have coped a yep. bit better with that situation. I don't I don't mm-hmm. know. I'm just spitballing here. Maybe yes, maybe <laughs> not. But I would have it would have been nice to at least have given that shot, and and see. Yeah, that's you know yeah. uh, I'm 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 from Coimbra, so Flip uh, live was used to live quite near me, and last time I sp- I've been with him on his presence, we were speaking about TTM, and he it, it told me that it was for him very very difficult to get used to that type <laughs> of racing and the German mentality. Did you share the same thoughts? Yeah, hundred percent. It was it was tricky. Um, I felt like. By not speak, by not speak, being able to speak German fluently, mm-hmm. uh, I was yeah. never going to be the chosen one to win that yeah, championship. And yeah. I could have no, some I'm... good races. I would maybe win w- one or two races a year, a couple of pole positions. But eighty percent of my year was working for my teammates. You know, being the last guy to pit, creating some traffic for the leaders, whatever, giving the slipstream in certain qualifying stuff mm-hmm. like that. And it was a little bit frustrating. Uh, and and by the end, I was actually happy to leave, to be honest. It, it was a shame because the car was an amazing car and the organization and the logistics of that championship were amazing. It was a little F1 paddock, you know. I had We had amazing facilities and it was super cool. Um, but the racing side of it, it wasn't, it wasn't always exciting. Uh, okay. and, and, and yeah, so, but again, like... I understand. I understand who pays my bills, and if I wear a BMW, but I'm not driving solo anymore. I'm not. I'm not paying my own racing. You know, I have a. I have a boss now, yeah. and you have to do what what they tell you. I remember one of my one race. I was on on pole position, and right after quali, I got back in the garage and I was congratulating my team. I wasn't even done congratulating all of them. My boss comes and he says, "Antonio, by lap one, you need to be third. Like fucking hell! Like I haven't even, <laughs> yeah. So it was, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, and then and then at the same time they asked me if I wanted to go. They were they were about to go to the WEC with the with the M8 with the to the World mm-hmm. Endurance Championship, and they they asked me, Tony, do you wanna do you wanna go to that championship? Do you wanna go and do endurance? And in a way, I was like, yeah, I do because. I, I felt like I wanted something new, but on the same hand was like, man, endurance, like, I think that's boring. Like I already, I already don't enjoy one and a half hour long races. How am I going to enjoy 24 hour long races? And today I think it was one of the best decisions I've ever done in my life because I love endurance racing. Um, I completely fell in love with what it is, with what it represents, with how you go racing um but i've also learned some lessons there you need to have the right teammates you need to have the right companionship otherwise it makes no sense at all to go to go do endurance racing but um today i think i am the luckiest guy in the world to be able to combine endurance racing formerly racing which i'm still racing for myself you know sprint racing so yeah i can't complain i uh, i'm in a lucky position that's part of the yep. next uh, set of questions that we have here is how you adapt yourself to transitions for the Formula E to the endurance races, uh, how, how that happened, you know, what, what type of trainings you guys have to do, um, everything. I think like every championship is so professional now that you you can see the both sides of the story. With Is it good to race too many cars in one season or is it bad? I think it's good. Uh, it's a it's a discussion that I have every year with my bosses. Uh, for the first time this year, I lost this discussion, and I will not be competing in in both championships. But I was always able to to prove my bosses wrong uh, in the past. And 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 the reality is that in the last three years, I have won both of of the championships that I compete in. I won Formula E three years ago. I won the the, the World Endurance Championship last year. So. Um, you know, on paper, Don't you know, I've won that. both of them. Yeah, no, I, 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 I obviously lo- winning Le Mans was a part of, of winning the championship last year. So 
I was even able to, I remember uh, 2022, so two years ago, I was able to win uh, a Formula E race the week after a WEC race. And the week after I got a last minute call to go and race in Brazil in the stock cars. And I won that also. So three weeks in a row, three different cars, three different tracks. And I won the three races. So obviously when you're in good, good momentum, confident, things happen differently. Uh, but I've always been a big fan of jumping into different cars. And I think like if you're, if you're racing and it starts raining, your ability to quickly understand or adapt your driving to different track conditions, whatever, tires going away from you. Uh, if the car is understeering or oversteering too much, you, you need to drive with your feet and with your hands. You need to adapt to that sort of stuff. And I think driving different cars, in my opinion, is a good thing. Um, but yeah, again, as I said before, I have bosses. I have people who who I have to respect and who take the bigger decisions. And, um, you know, I think this... You know, I'm, I'm 32 years old now, but hopefully still a long career ahead of me and, and I need to play the smart game. And, you know, if, if my bosses want me to do something, I need I need to respect that. And um, yeah, so that's how it's going to be this year. But I'm, I'm a big fan of racing different cars in, in different in the same year. Uh, just a technical question about moving into different cars. What is the highest barrier for you from going into a high downforce car? to something like a stock car, which doesn't have so much downforce? Uh, the first two laps, it's something that you kind of, you know exactly what you're expecting to, to feel because you keep switching every, every, every weekend. But the first two laps, like it's always harder going from Formula E to, to the wet car, to be honest. And um, also because in Formula E, we do a, a thousand days of simulator a year. It's insane. Like we spend all our life in that dark room. So naturally <laughs> you kind of, you kind of get, uh, reused to, to everything before you actually go out on track. Uh, and we can go deeper into that discussion because I'm actually not a huge fan of doing too much simulator because I think you start developing habits to that are not maybe not great for the real car. And, and I think maybe you guys can talk about that too. But anyway, uh, but every every time I, I, sw I questions, switch cars, the first two laps, it's like, oof, like okay, just quickly simulate everything again. And then it comes to you and everything okay. is natural again. So... Uh, I love it. And I, I actually love those two laps. It's hard, but it forces you to open up all your feelings, all your senses, everything to your maximum attention. And how quickly can you get back into it? And, and you know, like there's eight of eight or nine of us in FE doing those championships and WEC also a lot of those guys are racing WEC and GT3s and hypercars and stuff. So there are more drivers out there like me and they enjoy doing it. So, um, so yeah. That's great. Ricardo, another question? Uh, no, leaving the, the next one to you. Okay, I will, well, let's go to talking about Portugal. What do you think is missing to the next generation of Portuguese drivers? Opportunity, maybe, and awareness. And uh, the first thing, I, I mean, when I say opportunity, I'm talking about the financial side of things. It, it, exactly. It's, I can open up to, to, to what numbers were and are at the moment i remember racing a season in go-karts internationally for sixty thousand euros at the time and i know now you cannot race at the top level for less than two hundred thousand, and it cannot be it cannot be yes, that you need so that much. much money as a 12 13 14 15 year old to pursue a dream uh, in a thing that you put some fuel, and I know it's more complicated than this, and I've raced go-karts at international level uh, for factories even, and I know it's little F1 segments, but it cannot be. And uh, and obviously, uh, we live in a world where you cannot be spending 200 grand a year to, to, for, to see if your kid likes it or doesn't like it, or is he good enough or not. And already at the time, I thought 60 grand was a lot of money. And it mm -hmm. was, and it was, uh, uh, and, and now we're talking about four or five times more. So I think that needs to change. We need to take a big step back. We need to open, open a new road for people to start, uh, you know, to start racing. And obviously you need a little bit of a change of mindset because if you have, if you, let's say an imaginary world where you start a platform where 200 kids can start racing in 
I wouldn't say rental go-karts, but good basic go-karts. And out of these 200 every year, you pick two or three, five. Um, you can start creating the next generation. Um, but obviously, if you still have the other 200 or 300 kids racing at this top level, spending that much amount of money, then obviously it's going to be hard to, to compete. But if everyone shifted, if everyone accepts some kind of budget cap, um, yeah. you know, people don't need to have three chassis. People don't need to have seven engines as a 14-year-old. People don't need to use seven sets of tires in a race weekend, you know. Um, I think we could start there uh, and then, you know, and then things would, would get a little bit easier. And then uh, I think having an idol, having a, somebody to to open the gates for you, to, to dismystify it, to make, show you that, that it's possible. And I, you know, I try every day with my racing, with my results to be, to be a little bit that person. And I'm not alone. I obviously we have Philippe Albuquerque doing it, Tiago Monteiro, Miguel in, in the motorbikes. Uh, you know, there's a few of us out there trying to, and we have some kids coming. I think actually Tiago's Montero's son is doing super well. Uh, we have, we have a, a, a kid, a, a girl as well, doing super well. Uh, Germano, Maria Germano, she's super quick as well. And there's a few more kids actually around the block. So I actually think that we have some, a couple of kids there in, in the pipeline, uh, racing go-karts at the moment. Um, but it's not enough. We need more than three, four kids. You know, if you look at Spain, they have 25. If you look at England, they have another 30. If you look at Germany, they and Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, they have another 100. So yes. it's not enough. And it's always been our problem. And uh, and then I think if we, if you really want to make this more simple, we need a country that has a better government and, and puts yeah. a bit more money in yeah. everybody's pockets because if people are struggling to pay their houses, how are they going to go racing? So I understand there are bigger worries in the world at the moment for people to take their kids going racing. So, um, yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, the cost cap. That was actually one of my questions to you since you already mentioned there uh, should be a cost cap. Do you think that uh, the FIA should look at other series other than karting to make the jumps to to then uh, formulas like uh, Mazda MX-5s or the Kipi Cantos, for example, Lorenzo Monteiro used to drive the, the Kipi Cantos or, or the Caterham series, something like that, that could give you a jump into the formula series? I, I think that's not realistic, to be honest, because, you know, the FIA is 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 a very well run operation uh, also a bit political and they have put something in place which works at the moment or at least makes sense which is you have go-karts formula four formula three formula two formula yep. one simple you know the all, i think all the other championships are starting to die in my day we had formula three spain and then gp3 and then world series red great championships with great drivers and i saw you know alex palou never raced f2 uh, Magnussen, myself, we never raced F2, um, whatever. Like you, you could still make it with loads of different ways. And I think making it a bit more simple like they're doing it now, it's a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, they do need to intervene with prices because, I mean, we could go into numbers again, but I raced in F3 for... Uh, 150,000 euros uh, that season, and now you don't do it for less than 800,000. So oh, it, it cannot happen. You know, it cannot happen. And 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 the problem is, we are we are we will start to have a sport which is selective, uh, supremacist, and it's not anymore yeah. for. Okay, I know it's always been expensive, but it's becoming a selective sport, and and I don't want to be a part of that. You know, I. I if there's a kid that has a dream of going racing, he should at least have a small sniff at having a chance, you know, and at the moment that's impossible. Uh, so, yeah, and I think the FIA, I mean, slowly, another thing we need to understand is to control a cost cap. It requires a lot of manpower, more salaries, more everything. And the FIA is now doing that in F1 and they do it well. And they are now doing that in Formula E and they do it well also. And we're seeing a lot of results. I mean, I'm not flying business class every time anymore. I'm not staying in the mm -hmm. best hotels anymore. And I'm I'm completely okay with that. If it means like we're spending less, a couple less million a year as a team, as a manufacturer, perfect. I mean, it's not correct for a Formula One team to spend 500 million a year for two cars to go around in circles because it is as simple as that. Okay. It is as simple yeah. as that. We're just going around in circles how quickly you want to do it, how well you want to do it. I mean, now they're spending 300 million less and everything looks just as great. So as a fan, 
for the fans, you don't need to spend that much money, yeah. you know. So I think what they're doing with F1 and Formula E is great. Uh, let's see if they can start implementing that in other places. And it also shows that they care and they, they understand that it, it was getting way out of control. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, we already mentioned your uh, uh, racing season for this year without going to the WEC. Is uh, European Le Mans a chance for you? The Elms or the IMSA? No, no, no. I, I think that what's going on at the moment for me was that my, it's not like I lost my seat. Actually, that it was completely the opposite. I had everything in place to, to keep doing everything as, as I wanted. And to be honest, the WEC this year wasn't really a season for us because we got delivered the hypercar halfway through, uh, mm. not really a testing. So it was really a year just to kick things off and, and, and get started. And actually I was very happy with how it went. And we finished the year fighting for podiums. Um, with with a private team and a car that's super hard to run um so it was everything was just going to plan and next year was going to be our year to to attack it and uh you know together with Porsche but yeah mainly mainly my bosses they they felt that I should or we should give it a real crack at formula e and 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 you know different ways of thinking and again as i said before i need to respect and and that's okay So we they took the decision. We took the decision to do only one championship. Um, so yeah, it wasn't something I was super happy with. But um, but as I said before, I understand. And again, if if you have bosses, they they pay your bills. You have to respect. And I will I will approach it with with my biggest uh, efforts as always. And um, so yeah, doing other other types of racing is not not an option at at the moment in this year on okay. the table i would still like to compete in Le, in lama to be honest i think i've been doing that race for the last six years i've won it last year and i would i would like to do it again and uh, just to keep that streak going and uh, and i also believe that i will be back in the WEC very soon so i would i would not like to i would like to not disconnect completely and i think to do one race in the year and and the offers are there to to be able to do it so um i think it'll be okay to do that race hopefully i still need to call them and ask for that permission but i think that that's going to be okay and uh, you think you're going to ever share a uh, luma race with philippe talking about the same generation that same, would be awesome same. that would be cool okay. yeah <laughs> I, Philippe, Philippe is a driver that I that I love watching him race. I think we're actually quite similar. I think when the helmet goes on, we want to, you know, in the good way of the of the word, but we want to kill everything and kill everyone and just you know win, win, win. And we've actually had a few goes at each other, which always with a lot of respect. But it, it's um, it's it's you know I love racing up against people that love the sport as much as I do, and they share the same respect. And um, and it would be awesome to share a car with him, especially with someone that knows endurance racing probably better than me. Uh, you know, is we've we've basically won the same things already, but um, and to combine that experience would be would be great. Yeah, that would be a neat thing. But before we finish this segment of motorsport, we're gonna drop five words and say what comes straight away to, to your mind, if it's okay. Yeah. So to, to start it, Red Bull. Win wins, <laughs> not so much for me, but yeah, they keep winning. They keep winning. So, uh, Macau, uh, best track in the world. No, uh, Le Mans, second best track in the world. <laughs> DTM, painful, painful. Okay, hey, and Tiago Monteiro. My boss. Ah, oh, that's that's good. That's good. And yeah, now... Tiago is amazing. You know, me and Tiago, we have uh, we've been working together for 12 years. He's my manager, mm -hmm. and we don't have papers. Everything on a handshake deal. You know, that's how much confidence we have on on each other. He's a friend. He's a friend. And you think you think that that's help you a lot? That type of confidence that he put on you. You know. Uh, a hundred percent yes you know um, i mean tiago he comes to the end of the world with me he does it for me uh, i think i'm able to to have amazing deals and and race for amazing brands because of the person that he is 
Uh, it's great to have someone that it's also has also been and still is behind the wheel of a race car because you can discuss to the same degree. He knows exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about it. And uh, and I'm I'm very lucky that that we, you know, our paths in life cross and uh, he he's he's one of my best friends today. So 100%. And, and I will say personally, I think he's uh, underrated. I think people don't give the value to Tiago. I think he... Yeah. He, he, 100%. He, he, for, for us, as uh, we have the same age than the new, uh, he, he, he marked us, no, you know, the Lamy marked me because it was one of the first memories, but Tiago Monteiro was when you were growing up, seeing, seeing him yeah. on the yellow F1 is something, as a Portuguese, unique for us, no? So, but now let's go to the, is it two minutes? So this game is, is quite simple. Two minutes, you're going to have five tracks to guest and five moments your moments to guest. So try to do them in the maximum of the two minutes if it's possible. Uh, what is this? Singapore? No. Spain. Street circuit in Spain. Uh, this is this is Valencia, yeah. yeah. Valencia street track. Uh, Fuji? Whoa. Uh, 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 I know this one. This is a street track, also. Uh, what is this? T1. Uh, what the hell? No. America? No. Is this also for. Yeah. Is this also for the E tracks? Uh, it's Endurance. No. Endurance yeah. America. Yeah. Indy. Oh, this is. Yeah. This is. Indy car. This is Long Beach. Yeah, yeah perfect. This is Long Beach. Major E Formula 2. What the hell is Fra this? France Formula 2, Formula 3. Old school Renault 3.5. Quite a, a bad word in Portuguese, I would say. What? You know, if you don't know, we can Formula skip it. Two in France. Yep. I don't know this one. Okay, let's go for the huh. next one. And to finish, Formula E. <laughs> Central, Formula e. Central America. I think it's the only one on Central America that you guys I, run. I, we skip it. What is this? Chi Chile? Uh, no, it's Mexico. This is Mexico. Uh, no. What? No, this is not Mexico. Let's go to the next one. The moment. Okay. This is Budapest World Series 2012. Yeah, from the 2020. So this is the number 18, is my first year, 2014, DTM. Yeah, Macau, 2016. And to finish. This is WEC, Le Mans. This is Le Mans, yeah. My first or second one with BMW, yeah. 20, 2019. Perfect. Small break on the podcast to talk with you about how you can help us to bring more of this type of interviews. First of all, a big shout to Imsim to supporting our podcast this time. They just delivered on the last week on a Sim Expo a new full Sim motion rig and have a look at it. It's absolutely gorgeous. But of course, I will be talking about it on the next episode. If you want to support us, remember, join us on the Patreon. Let me slide to my left and appear on the right. You have here the way that you can do it. Remember that join our Patreon. You are joined Games with Cancer as every quarter of a year we share half of our profits with them. And of course, you can do the same on the YouTube. Just hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment. It's very important if you leave a comment for we know what you like it or not on the podcast, where we can improve and that will bring more engagement. And talking about engagement, you can do the same on the audio. Just scroll up when you're listening to our podcast, type what you think about the episode, and of course, give us five stars to keep delivering the best content possible. Without any further, let's go back to our podcast. But now, let's move it to the sim racing, and uh, Ricardo will be the, the biggest guy taking care, yeah. as he's the biggest sim racer from all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish that was the biggest sim racer. Uh so uh for sim racing, what 
How do you use it? Do you use it just as a training tool or is it as a way to to decompress or to learn? So 100% number one to decompress and have fun uh, in my simulator at home, which it's on a, on a decent level, I would say. I have some some decent hardware that I can compete. And I think when the, the, the pandemic hit, uh, I was forced to upgrade a lot of my stuff because then I started racing some faster people and what I had wasn't <laughs> wasn't good enough. <laughs> so I'm looking at that steering wheel there and I think that's a Logitech, if I'm not mistaken. And I can already tell you that I don't think yeah. that's... Yeah, this is Trust Master. <laughs> this is Trust Master and uh, yeah. the Trust Master's behind. And, uh, yeah. They're not, they're not quick yeah, enough. If you want to beat, if you want to compete, I'm not even say going to beat, but if you want to compete, try to compete with Lando Norris, Max Verstappen, all of those guys, forget it. No chance. Anyway, I love iRacing. I think, uh, I mean, I like our factor as well. And, you know, I like to play, but I, I, I think iRacing is so real. It's not a game. It's a simulator. It's actually a, a real simulator. You cannot, you can only drive within you know, the eye view of the driver and, and to do the setup, you don't go on right height plus or minus. You actually have to go and move your springs and stuff like that. And so it's super realistic, all, all sides of the of the game. I know there's some conversations about the, the tire model and this and that, but don't believe me. Tire models gives me the biggest headache, even in the real simulators with F1, FE, tire models is our hardest thing to to you know, replicate. Um, okay. So yeah, I racing at home. I love it. I think the, the platform is great to how you can go racing every half an hour, every 45 minutes, every hour, whatever with a huge community. So I really, really enjoy it. Uh, and then it's super simple as well to, to host some races for your friends or your fans or whatever. So yeah, I really, I really like it. And, um, and I think when you're like in the winter and stuff, when you're not racing for a while to keep yourself sharp, racing around people, uh, it's it, it's not hurting you. For sure, it's never hurting you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do you think, uh, do you have the same mentality as Max Verstappen? As Ma Max uses not not much as a, a training tool, but uh, a tool to keep you in the mentality of winning. Yeah, that, that's what I just said. I think it, it keeps you sharp as in, you know, how to, your finesse on your driving, you know, you still have to, chase the last hundreds every time you get on it then there is no there's no way around it you try to be fast right try to go faster every lap you try to improve go faster so naturally you put you end up putting your brain in the same mindset as a race weekend so i think that's what it's good about it obviously max is doing it at a different level where he owns his own his own sim racing team and it's impressive how much effort he actually puts into that and you know, he told me a story the other day, like he wakes, he woke up at 3 a.m. with an idea. They were going to go racing somewhere with an idea for a setup. He texts all of his team, guys, wake up. We need, to, we all need to do a back-to-back -back test for the front camber. And they at 3 a.m., he forced everyone to wake up, go to the sim and do a stint, a full stint, which is an hour long to see how the tire deck was then going. So he woke up everyone in his team at 3 a.m. to go and do a back-to-back -back test for the front camera or whatever. So it shows you like he's, you know, when you love the sport, you love the sport and uh, and it, that it extends to this type of stuff. And obviously we, if you own a sim racing team and you're you're emotionally invested and financially invested, then obviously you try to to do it better and, and and you love it more. You end up loving it more. So I think it's awesome. Also, the other side of things, how you can make, how you guys can maybe get into a server and race against, which has happened to me, but race against Rubens Barrichello, Tony Canan, Fernando Alonso, so many other worldwide drivers that are just logging into to these normal servers like myself as well. So um, I think that's that's awesome. You were talking about opening doors. Uh, to to kids, or to to talent in Portugal or somewhere else. Uh, do you think sim racing can be a tool like that? Absolutely, I think sim racing can be a great way to to alert uh, you know young kids about racing and and to see you know to to wake up that this if they're willing to do it, if they like it, if they're good at it. Uh, but I think as soon as possible, you have to start driving something real. Uh, because I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of cases where 
You can be amazing at a simulator and then not so great in a real car. I know a lot of great, amazing drivers in real cars that are not great in simulators. And then, yes, you have the cases where people are just great at both or also suck at both. So uh, that also happens. Um, but yeah, so I, I you know, actually, I'm, I'm a little bit scared with how many real seats are going to, you know, manufacturers when obviously testing now and budget caps, they're testing you to go to go. They're limiting you to go testing these days and they put two or three drivers in, in the sim if they're on simulator and they end up picking the drivers based off of their day in the sim, which I don't think it's if I don't think it's the right approach because or maybe it could be, but I wouldn't base it off lap time alone. How do you work with your engineers? Yeah. How do you set up a car? How do you approach a new racetrack, a new race car, uh tire degradation, fuel saving, all of that stuff. But but if you just base it on lap time, I think it's super dangerous because, I mean, if you guys are into sim racing, you know this better than me, but you can have these little tricks on how you place the car and yeah. you touch this yeah, and there, the steering angles everywhere. and there's sliding around. This. It, it, it is a game. At the end of the day, yeah. it's a game and there are these little tricks. You know, if I get into a sim tomorrow, uh, <laughs> you know, all these pro kids will destroy me. They will destroy me. And I know that if we go into, into a real car, they will be further away from me than what I am from them in the simulator. So, mm -hmm. and that's fine. That's completely fine. I actually end up respecting a lot of these guys. And every time I see them, I know a lot of the guys from Redline and I know a lot of the guys from Coanda. And every time I see them, I'm like, guys, fuck, help me. How can I improve this? How do you do that? How do you do this? And they're always super nice and super helpful to to help. But uh, But yeah, at the end, I almost think it's almost like two different sports you know, two different categories. Okay. So we have now to be a little overlap. bit careful analyzing, but, but absolutely there is a, a big overlap on both. So how do you, how are you looking at the evolution of sim racing from, I don't know, say 2018 to now going past uh, Corona? Yeah, I think that the, the, the pandemic was a huge boost for, for games in general, the, 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 the metaverse world, uh, every kind of, Every everything game related and 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 uh, esports uh, related, uh, sim racing was obviously a part of that, and it was insane how many steering wheels were sold, how many seats, how many downloads, <laughs> how many whatever. Um, and I think obviously there's been a drop since then. You know, people have gone back to their normal lives, no, normal jobs. Nobody's spending twenty four hours at home anymore. But uh, it, it grew for sure. It grew. The rate has has gone down. Of of the growth, but it's it's still growing. Absolutely, it's still growing, and uh, and, I, and you can see like even being with Porsche, you know, part of our part of our OEM or manufacturing future plans are involve sim racing. You know, they have they have a factory uh, team in Le Mans, they have a factory team in DTM, they have a factory team in Formula E, and they have a factory team in esports. It, it's this is official. Yeah. They have their own factory esports team they are they have the same driver contract as i do so they are factory drivers but they only race simulators so i think that's awesome i think that's that shows the interest of the manufacturers as well and like you were saying it can be a much cheaper way for people to eventually start okay do you think that uh, that explosion that happened during corona uh, was was more was was it a boon or a detriment for for the sport for sim racing itself? Do you think that it brought a lot of bad things? Uh, I'm not aware of the bad things that that it brought. I, you know, it brought some disappointment personally for me because I thought I was pretty good at it, and then I realized that I wasn't. <laughs> Because okay. a lot of other drivers were actually becoming quite good at that, so you don't you cannot understand how much of my day I was dedicating to the simulator to the point where now I'm like, I can't look at it. If it's sunny outside, I'm going to go surfing. I'm going to go play golf. But in the winter, I love firing it back up and, and getting into it again. Um, but yeah, like it's, uh, I don't really understand or I, I can't see what it was bad about it, to be honest. Um, I thought mm -hmm. it was great that so many worldwide drivers got involved, were streaming, were showing the world what sim racing is all about and you know doing it at a high high level with engineers engineering your car and stuff like that so i thought it was great 
Okay. I think I, I have also a question is that uh, during that during that time, uh, do you think that now the companies are a little more aware of sim racing to the point that the, the, the drivers start to have media training to, to be in front of a, of a stream or to be in the front of a situation that they are around in sim racing? Um, I think, look, the world has been going into, it's, it's becoming quite sensitive. And I understand there's things you cannot do, things you cannot say. Um, but uh, it, it, people get offended very, very easily these days. With, it could be a joke, it could be whatever. Um, and we had some cases with, uh, with some drivers during the pandemic ac- losing their actual real yeah, race seats yeah. to things they did or said. On, on their live streams. Uh, we had Kyle Larson in NASCAR. We had Daniel Abt in Formula E and maybe one or two more cases. But uh, yeah. the Daniel Abt case was very close to me because he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a friend. And, uh, and honestly, as a driver and an athlete, that could have been something I did. You know, I, I've spent my year joking, joking around with people. And, and Daniel is actually a bit of a YouTuber, whatever. And and what he did there was was only a joke, and he actually ended up losing his his real race. Mm-hmm. So, and I wasn't happy about it. Some of us drivers, we try to get behind that and support that, because if we let that happen as a precedent, then it means all of us are at risk. With, and honestly, from that day onwards, I never streamed again, because you know if there's I say a lot of dumb stuff, and uh, and if I if if I was gonna get myself in trouble with jokes then uh, then I decided to never stream again and I think you know we end up losing we end up losing maybe the funny guys or the relaxed guys and you know if you're if you're just streaming for fun and you end up speaking like a robot like if you're giving an, an yeah, post race I mean. interview yeah. then that's not fun uh, I mean for I guess for you guys you don't have sponsors or you don't represent big brands so you can do and say whatever you want and I would love to do that and I think once I stop racing, I would maybe go back to that and I will, you know, maybe offend some people, but at least I will be free. Not not like I'm not free now. Like I'm just, I can just say like, you know, like, man, that sweater is this or what? what's that microphone? And some people could get really offended, you know? And yeah, I, I so understand I, I exactly decided, what you mean. I just decided to go on the safe side and just focus on my real racing. But I think, you know, I'm sad to see some guys not streaming anymore for sure. Now, uh, my last question is, which simulator do you prefer? Yours at home or yours at the factory? <laughs> I tell the I, I say this to them every day, but mine at home. <laughs> You're at home, okay. So, For any specific reason? The thing is, yes, number one, so number one, and maybe the only one where mine at home is better, is the graphics. Uh, it's very expensive to have a huge yeah, 180 okay, degree okay. screen. Yeah, and okay. they are they are using they are using projectors. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. in the factory, which is a bit dated, to be honest. It was the way to go, ten, fifteen years ago. Uh, and I know F one teams are now are they are now going back to screens because mm-hmm. with screens you can get a much higher uh, frame rate ratio mm-hmm. and and all the hertz and and all of that. So the the it just ends up being a lot nicer to look at especially when we spend so many hours in in that sim but actually i would i would put that as a number two reason the number one reason is that i hate to drive on my own i hate to drive on my own you know i'm a race i like to bang wheels and compete with people and overtake and defend and race you know when i drive i i mean i'm not saying i'm i don't do it well and i don't put my efforts in and i understand the importance of the of going to the simulator and doing all the pre race procedure stuff, and I do it and I do it well, but I'm I don't love it. You know I don't okay. I don't love it, and I I don't think any any race driver loves it. I, I I remember when I was young and I started doing as a as an F1 test driver. I was like wow, huge sim, Red Bull on the side, <laughs> amazing engineers. Sure, like call me every day, uh, and naturally as you grow up and then you end up wanting your own sim driver to develop the stuff for you, and uh, and yeah, I know I tell that to every time to our to our kid in in the in the Porsche factory. Like, man, I've been in your place before. You go and you warm up the tires for me. You warm up the sim for me. 
Uh, and, you know, and they do it with pleasure because, you know, it's, I've been in that position before where you try to show your talent and every chance you get to get on the, you know, on the radar of your bosses, you do it. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's not for fun. It's for work. And I think my sim at home is for fun. So I naturally, when I look at it, I, I assimilate more fun than the, when I look at my, at my simulator in the factory. Yeah, this that makes total sense. I have one last question. <laughs> Not sim racing related. I, it's a question from my viewers, and then I promise I stop because I, we're already using a lot of your time. No worries. If you could race any car at any circuit, which one would it be? Good question. If you know, if I have to go for a combo like that, I would probably go for. But the car that I've raced or that I would like doesn't to race. matter. Doesn't matter. Car that you race. So I would probably raced. go to the F one F one cars of twenty twenty one. So the fast, fast, fast ones. Okay. The big wings, the big tires. And I would probably put it in Le Mans, maybe. You know. Okay. With or, or without Nord the chicane. <laughs> or Norch <laughs> with the chicane. <laughs> or Norch Life. But Norch Life, I think. Maybe a few years ago, I would have not been scared. Today, I think I would have been a little bit scared. But uh, yeah. but yeah, probably an F1 car. In uh, But I think to this day, the best combo I've ever driven is F3 and Macau. I mean, nothing beats that. Nothing beats that combo. It just fits perfectly together. It's crazy good. I imagine because even, on, awesome. sim, even on, on sim racing is one of my favorites is... The, the way that you need to drive, the, the techniques that you need to use is, is a yeah. great track, is, is amazing. And we go yeah. to the five words of now related with sim racing to finish. And the first one is immersion. Uh, off. Off. <laughs> streaming, we already <laughs> know the, the answer, but streaming. Off. <laughs> I racing. Perfect. Uh, sim racers fast and Ricardo Ooh. we have a last one uh, actually I don't <laughs> okay <laughs> I, I didn't have any, any more words I, I try I try <laughs> I try to get it but I could not get it for my for my part Antonio thank you so much because you know you are a, even so you much. are in winter time is a busy period for you and thank you so so much for giving us this opportunity for us, for me, on a small channel, and even to to Ricardo, to have you with us. Thank you so much. No worries at all. Thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, I'm actually going straight back to work on the second, straight back to the sim at, in Stuttgart with Porsche. So, only a small a small holiday and a few more days, and we're straight back to work. So yeah, it's cool. And and we hope see you in uh, London, uh, on Formula E that is close to us, and I hope. Winning the again the Formula E title will the be title. amazing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure. Yeah.